Solar power for your RV or camper van gives you the freedom to go where you want to go without giving up any of the conveniences that make life enjoyable. In this video, I wanna give you a detailed view of how we put together the electrical system for our van that gives us the freedom that we have. I wanted to do this video to help out anybody who's thinking about or planning their own off-grid solar system. My goal is to provide enough detail about the system I designed that most of you, with or without experience with electricity, would have all the information that you need to duplicate the system if you wanted to, or at least have the blueprint for any portion of the system that you like. I'm not sponsored by any of the companies that made the products I used in this system. My goal is to help you, not them, so I'm not going to be linking any of the products that I've used in the system in the description below. I do, however, want to share the bill of materials and all of the diagrams that I'll be using later in this video. So for anybody who's interested, please do look down in the description and I'll give you instructions on how to contact me for those. The living space in the camper van that we travel in full time is split up between the van and a trailer. Each one of them has their own separate and independent electrical systems. If you're not familiar with the layout, I have a complete tour video that's available that I'll link uh, in the description below. All right, I'm gonna start this off right by talking about the sexiest part of the design first, which is fault protection. Seriously, this is the most important part of the entire design. This is the part that's gonna make sure that you're out there getting Instagram photos of amazing places instead of crying over the smoldering heap of what used to be your house. This is not the place to try and save a few bucks. These devices have to have the right current rating and voltage rating for the circuit that they're being used in. There are also some other factors like interrupt rating that may be important. Fortunately, the user manual for most of the major components that you'll be using in your system will specify the type and size of device that you should be using. For more help, just Google the term RTFM. The van's electrical system is fully standalone, so it has all of the elements necessary for an off-grid system. This includes power storage, power collection, and the loads that will use power. The nice thing about electrical designs is that they can be broken down into smaller, easier to understand blocks. But to make sure you have a consistent frame of reference, as we move from block to block, I want to point out what is basically the backbone of the electrical system, the DC bus. Sorry, not that kind of DC bus. I'm talking about a couple of heavy duty metal bars called bus bars that create the common connection point for both the positive and negative side of the DC system. All of the power, no matter whether it's coming in or going out, have to pass through these bars. I'm pointing it out because just about everything in the system connects to it. So it's the one common thing that you're gonna see as we zoom in on different parts of the system. So I'm gonna break the system down into its functional blocks, which are how we collect power, how we store power, and how we use power. Let's start off by taking a close look at the collection block. If I was He-Man, this section would be very simple. All I gotta do is take my sword, connect a wire to the hilt, hold it up, and yell at a castle. Done. I have the power. Unfortunately for me, it hasn't been that easy, although not for a lack of trying. We found three other sources of power much more reliable, so I'm going to break the collection block into three sub blocks. That would be solar, shore power, and the alternator. Solar panels collect light energy and convert it to electrical energy. The problem is the voltage and current that are output from solar panels is not ideal for the rest of the system. So this block also includes a solar charge controller. Its job is to efficiently convert the voltage and current from the solar panels into something the rest of the system can use. The solar charge controller also has to be sized to tolerate the voltage from the panels. I selected the Victron MPPT-150 because it can handle up to 100 volts from the solar panels and it can output up to 700 watts, more than enough for the panels I'm using. 
Real estate on the roof of the van is a limiting factor, and I determined that a 60 cell panel was the best use of the available space. I chose these specific panels because I found them locally on Craigslist, which saved me the shipping expense. I wired the panels in series by connecting the positive terminal of one panel to the negative terminal of the other panel. I'm using a series connection instead of a parallel connection because it minimizes the power lost in the cables that go from the panels to the solar charge controller. To extend the solar panel cables from the roof to the controller inside the van, I just cut a 40 foot MC4 extension cable in half. The finished ends of the extension cable connect to the panel connectors and the cut ends extend down into the van. I created a waterproof pass-through by using a double cable gland box to get the cables inside the van. I drilled two holes in the roof close to each other so that they would be completely covered by the cable gland box. Then I installed a grommet in each of the drilled holes to protect the cable insulation from the sharp sheet metal edge of the hole. The cable gland box needs to be adhered to the roof over the drilled opening. I've used two different methods to mount the box. The first using Sikaflex polyurethane adhesive and a second method using VHB double-sided tape. In this video, I'm showing the adhesive method to mount the box, but I really do recommend the other method, VHB, that I'll show in a later video. Both the positive and negative cables from the solar panels after they pass through the roof are routed down to a couple fuse holders that have 15 amp 1kV DC fuses. The first thing I want to point out about the fuses between the solar panels and the solar charge controller is that they have a DC voltage rating well above what they're going to see from the solar panels. When I just did a search on Amazon for 15 amp fuses, the ones that come up primarily are the automotive style, which only have a voltage rating of 32 volts. The other kind that come up frequently are the 5 by 20 millimeter glass style cylindrical type of fuses. Those have an AC rating that's the 250 volts normally, but they have a DC rating that's below what they would see coming from the solar panels. The fuse holders also act like a cutoff switch, so I can completely disconnect the solar panels from the rest of the system if I need to. After passing through the fuses, I used some 10 gauge wire left over from the extension cable to connect to the plus and minus inputs of the solar charge controller. The negative output of the controller is connected to the negative bus bar with a 6 gauge wire. The positive output of the controller is connected to the positive bus bar through a 70 amp ANL fuse. I selected 6 gauge wire to run from the controller to the bus bars because 6 gauge is the largest wire that would fit in the controller's output connectors. I chose the 70 amp fuse because it's high enough to avoid nuisance blowing and is well below the maximum amperage of 6 gauge wire. Intermission. End of intermission. Shore power, which is 120 volts AC from the power grid, is also a source that you can use whenever it's available. Many paid campsites in the U.S. have 30 amp service at 120 volts, but a lot of them also have 15 or 50 amp service. I chose the NEMA 515 receptacle instead of the 30 amp type that's normally used on RVs because I already have the extension cords and I don't have any loads that require 30 amp service. I picked up an adapter so I can connect in places where only the 30 amp receptacle is available. If you're staying with some friends or family, they probably also have a 15 or 20 amp circuit that they might let you connect to. Since my goal was a stealth camper, I wanted to hide as many of the telltale signs for a camper as possible, like electrical hookups or water hookups. I found a spot just under the passenger side rear bumper that I could install a plastic mounting plate for the receptacle. Here, the plug is easy to access and not visible to people who are walking by. It's also right next to a large grommet that Ford designed into the transit that allows the wire to access the inside of the vehicle without drilling a hole through the floor. Shore power comes into the van through a NEMA 515 receptacle. I used a 12 gauge three conductor outdoor rated cable to transfer shore power from the receptacle to a two bay breaker box. 
I chose the two circuit box because it was the only one that fit the space I had available and I only need breakers for incoming shore power and the AC outlets in the van. Shore power passes through a 20 amp breaker then exits the box and is routed to the input of a 1000 watt Renogy inverter charger. I decided to use an inverter charger because it really simplifies the AC portion of the design, but more on that later. When you are connected to shore power, an AC charger is necessary to make the conversion from AC power to DC power appropriate for your system. The charger portion of this device converts the 120 volts AC into a DC voltage to charge the batteries and run 12 volt equipment. Battery charging current exits the inverter charger through a 1 aught gauge wire to the positive and negative DC bus bars. The positive side has a 200 amp class T fuse in line. The wire and fuse selection to the DC bus has more to do with the inverter operation than it does with the AC charger operation, so I'll hit that later too. I connected to the van's electrical system using the Ford Customer Connection Point, or CCP, on the left rear side of the driver's seat. Transit T250s have at least one CCP, but can have up to three as an option. The CCP was intended to supply current to a customer supplied load, so I had confidence that it would safely supply up to the 60 amp limit that Ford specified. The CCP is just the positive side of the vehicle electrical system, so I also made a connection to an open connection point on the negative battery cable under the driver's seat. I ran eight gauge wires from these points up the B pillar to the passenger rear corner. Here each of the lines passes through a cutoff switch. I included the battery switches because they prevent loads like the lights and fans from draining the starter battery. There are battery relays or isolators that would do this automatically, but I picked the switches for a couple of reasons. First of all, I only intend to use the alternator to supply power to the house loads or the batteries as a last resort. A relay is going to make the connection any time the starter is turned on. Secondly, I wanted the ability to operate in the opposite direction and use solar power to trickle charge the starter battery, or in an emergency, use the house batteries to jump start the starter battery. I have a cutoff switch on both the positive and negative lines because the house electrical system is normally isolated from the vehicle electrical system. So both positive and negative connections need to be opened or closed. The negative line goes directly to the negative bus bar. The positive line passes through a self-resetting 40 amp breaker before connecting to the positive bus bar. Most days we collect power faster than we can use it. The excess is sent to the battery bank and it's stored there until it can be used to power lights, fans, and other devices at night. We also have a battery monitor that keeps track of the state of charge of the battery bank. The battery bank weighs a little over 130 pounds and is located over the rear axle on the passenger side. So I built a heavy duty hold down cage out of angle iron and threaded rod that is bolted through the metal floor of the van. I connected the batteries to each other and to the DC bus bars using custom cables that I built out of single aught cable and cable lugs. I built my own cables because the beefy components they're made from are pretty fun to work with. I also ended up with cables that were exactly the sizes I needed so the installation is much neater. It can be less expensive too, it just depends on the number of cables you intend to make. The batteries are 12 volts each, so I have them connected in parallel to keep the battery bank 12 volts. The positive bus bar is connected to the positive terminal of one battery, and the negative bus bar is connected to the negative terminal of the other battery. This ensures that the impedance seen by each battery in the bank is the same to help keep them balanced. In my opinion, a battery monitor is mandatory for any off-grid system. Besides the fact that many batteries can be damaged if they're discharged too low, a battery monitor also gives you immediate feedback on how you're using power. A major component to living with an off-grid system is being aware of your power usage. An AC or alternating current load is the kind of device you would normally plug into an outlet in your house. Most of the time, we rely on the inverter, which takes DC power from the batteries and converts it into the AC power that these kinds of devices need. 
The inverter draws more current than anything else in the system, which is the reason for the large cables and fuse here. With a surge rating of 2 kilowatts, it's possible to draw as much as 175 amps from the batteries. I'm using a Class T fuse because it has a higher interrupt rating than the a &L fuses do. The inverter portion of the inverter charger consumes power anytime it's on, so it's best to leave it off if no AC devices are in use. The inverter charger is located below the bed, so I got the remote control panel for a convenient way to turn the inverter on and off. I mounted the remote control panel on the wall near the side door of the van and connected it to the inverter charger with the control cable that came with the remote control. I connected AC output from the inverter charger to a 15 amp breaker in the second bay of the breaker box. I ran power to one outlet near the sliding door and another near the bathroom sink with 14.2 Romex cable. The inverter charger really simplifies the AC portion of the design because it automatically switches from inverter operation to shore power operation when shore power is connected. I'll show a couple diagrams that show how it changes configuration depending on what source of power is being used for AC devices. First is inverter operation. That is, when the inverter draws power from the batteries to create AC. When the inverter charger senses that no shore power is available, it automatically makes the vehicle chassis ground connection and connects the output of the inverter to the AC output terminal. The next diagram is shore power operation. When the inverter charger senses shore power is connected, it disconnects the inverter from the output terminals and connects them directly to the incoming shore power. It also switches its ground connection from chassis to the ground provided by the shore power input. Wherever possible, I selected devices that operate directly off of the battery because it's more efficient than powering from the inverter. Fortunately in the van, that's mostly what we use. Power for all the DC loads is distributed by a six circuit fuse block. The fuse block gets power from the positive and negative DC bus through six gauge wires. I installed a 100 amp breaker in the positive line to match the overall current limit of the fuse block itself. I've placed a block describing each circuit because there would be too much going on if I showed all the details here. Instead, we'll look at each block by itself. I'll start with the simplest circuit. I had an unused circuit and this dual 12 volt outlet hanging around, so I wired it up. I should get a clamp light to plug in here so I can find stuff under the bed at night. I installed a couple panel mount DC outlets and a gooseneck light on the wall on each side of the bed near the head. I ran a pair of 12 gauge wires from the fuse block to the outlet that was furthest away. All of the other components are wired in parallel by using insulation displacement or IDC type wire splices to tap into those 12 gauge wires. This circuit is pretty simple too. I just routed a set of 12 gauge wires past the fan and then on to the bathroom DC outlet. Here's another really simple circuit where the most difficult part was actually routing the wires. Here I added a switch that's mounted near the sink so that I can shut off the pump in case the tank is empty so that it prevents the pump from running continuously. The first switch controls a set of three puck lights that are over the area you can stand between the cab and the bed. The second switch controls four puck lights that are over the top of the bed. And the third switch controls accent lights that are on each side of the bed. Similar to the last diagram, three switches control lights over the toilet slash shower, the bathroom sink, and the bathroom mirror. Just a reminder, if you'd like a copy of the bill of materials and all of the diagrams that I used in this video, please take a look down in the description and there's going to be some instructions on how to reach out to me to get a hold of those. Also, soon I'm going to be releasing a video on the much larger solar system that I built for the trailer, so keep an eye out for that too.